Please turn in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3 as we continue our journey through the Bible, specifically the Old Testament on Sunday nights. And the title of this message is Seeking Redeeming Love. Yes, it's a romance. <laughs> as we move forward in our story, there's been several months at this point, uh, as we come into chapter 3 of uh, the barley harvest that has been passed, and um, you know, just looking at those months going by, it would seem that there's no real development that's happening between Ruth and Boaz. Uh, just life goes on day by day. Ruth continues to glean uh, the fields with the servants of Boaz, and presumably her daily needs are met, as we covered last week in chapter 2. And as readers of the story, we wonder what's going to happen. And uh, there, we're, we're going to learn that there's kind of the continue underlining principle of the providence of God and how he leads, how he guides, how he opens doors, closes doors. There's no coincidences in God's kingdom. But there's also an element of perseverance through uh, this story as well with Ruth. Uh, perseverance is really that kind of unique combination of patience and endurance, uh, of plus endurance, I should say. And it, it's about keep pressing on, staying the course, staying focused, uh, and sometimes perseverance is expressed on upon our waiting upon the Lord. So as she's just going about her business, uh, focusing on the Lord and taking care of the needs of uh, Naomi. You're seeing how the Lord is going to uh, direct her steps as well. We also see this, this chapter is kind of about refining and rest and rewards. Uh, just as Christians grow in our faith and our walk with the Lord, we need to be tried and refined. And so this chapter doesn't leave us there, though, but it shows us the rest, um, the fruit is produced in such a time uh, when we're waiting on the Lord, when we're going through times of refining. <clears throat> That's where you're going to see the choicest fruit in our lives, the refinement that happens. In our last study, we saw how Ruth immediately was smitten in love, seeing Ruth um, with Boaz, and um, and so uh, it's he's been initiating contact in this conversation with her uh, up to this point. He's gone out of his way to talk to her. Uh, he vowed to protect her, provide for her, and then they had a meal together. And it would seem that his heart is set upon becoming her kinsman redeemer uh, from the get-go. But in this study, we're going to see that it's up to Ruth now uh, to make the proposal to Boaz to become her uh, kinsman uh, redeemer and take her as his bride. So it's kind of a little different from our Western uh, perspective. And uh, we're going to concentrate really uh, on the preparation that Ruth makes before coming to Boaz. So there's a unique uh, couple verses here that we will uh, look at. We'll see the very things that Naomi tells Ruth to do in order to prepare, uh, to propose to uh, uh, Boaz for marriage. Um, and uh, these are things that we should do as Christians as well. So we can uh, not spiritualize the text, but we can take application from it. Uh, and there are some who are used to uh, making this correlation between Ruth, how she prepares herself coming to Boaz, symbolizing the coming of uh, uh, the, the church to make to Christ um, when we come to him to be saved or our personal salvation experience. So there's some correlation there as well. But seeing this particular story as it's going to be taking place, this night of threshing also can symbolize the church preparing for the rapture uh, and uh, for the end of the, the church age, as we've talked about. Uh, and we can also recognize the very preparations of those that uh, ought to make and prepare in our hearts uh, for the imminent return of Christ. And again, as we all believe uh, that he can return at any moment, there's no prophecies that are left unfulfilled for his coming back. And uh, But the Lord promised that he will return at a time when we least expect it, so we just need to be ready. Anyways, back to our story without, uh, again, some careful explanation. This third chapter of the story of Ruth uh, can be uh, a strange and sometimes difficult to understand from our contemporary Western perspective. So let's just dive into our text and, and work through this for a better understanding. Verse 1, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, Boaz, whose young woman you were with. 
Is he not our relative? For in fact, he is renewing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So as we see here, Naomi's telling Ruth to consider having Boaz to become her kinsman redeemer. And the prospect of Ruth and Boaz brings her hope and excitement. So Naomi sought security for Ruth. The word that's translated security there is kind of another word that we can get to a place of rest or a condition of rest. Uh, and it was at that time, as you know, what the parents' job was to set up marriages uh, ranging in that culture. And so Naomi feels it's her responsibility to set Ruth up uh, for uh, Boaz. And so Ruth was the relative. He was the responsibility to act as the Goel or as the kinsman redeemer. And if Ruth named him as the Goel, he was to step up and step in and marry Ruth and continue the bloodline of Emelech. Now, before Naomi and Ruth left Moab, as you remember back in chapter 1, uh, to return into the land of Israel, Naomi convinced Ruth that if she was to move uh, to uh, Israel, that there's a good chance that she may not marry, because the Israelites were not to marry the Gentiles, let alone someone from Moab and Ammon. So those were kind of no-nos at that time. So thus, up to this point in time, uh, Ruth has not even really thought about a husband uh, or marriage to Boaz or any other man in Israel, uh, for that matter. She just seemed to be concentrating on taking care of Naomi and gleaning the fields of Boaz. Now, Ruth at this point here in chapter 3 may have been gleaning the fields uh, between three to eight weeks, so several months in this period of time since we left off in chapter 2. And so she's starting to think about caring for Ruth and making sure uh, that the name and the inheritance of her deceased husband, Emelech, is passed on. So Naomi tells Ruth about the fact that now is the harvest and it's been complete. The sheaves of the barley uh, have been picked and it's going to be threshing on this particular evening. And there's several things to understand about threshing <clears throat> in, uh, in back in Ruth's day. Threshing floors uh, in Ruth's day were typically kind of this round shape uh, placed on top of the hill or some place where there'd be maximum amount of wind. Uh, the threshing is the process of removing the wheat from the chaff. Uh, so the sheaves were breaking, uh, you know, free from the wheat, and then they throw up into the air and the winds blow away the chaff, and then the wheat falls to the ground. So that's how they had the pile of wheat at that time. So threshing was usually completed in the afternoon, evening, early period of time because the winds typically were the strongest at that point. So the owner of the field would then, um, at the completion of the threshing, uh, sleep right there on the fleshing, threshing floor um, where the wheat is so that the thieves wouldn't come in and steal what they had labored for for all year. So this is where you're going to see Boaz sleeping there, uh, which from our perspective, why are you sleeping with the wheat? But so that thieves wouldn't come in and steal. So <clears throat> Naomi knew that after finishing the, the threshing that Boaz, his workers would be sleeping uh, this evening right in the threshing floor with their heads laying on the wheat uh, and their feet facing outwards. And so there's nothing inappropriate that we're going to see here about Ruth coming to where Boaz is, sleeping on this night because it was a public place. Verse 3 continues with the instructions from Naomi. So it's, therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garments and go down to the th threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go uncover his feet, lie down and he will tell you what you should do. And he said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So as you see here in verse 3, how Naomi suggests and really instructs and it's better yet commanded uh, Ruth how she's to prepare herself uh, to have this encounter with Boaz. So these instructions were to make Ruth uh, as attractive to Boaz as possible. Um, so she was not to make herself known until after supper. So Naomi tells Ruth 
to go wash, to dress up in appearance, and go lay at Boaz's feet and ask him to take her to be his bride, uh, to be his kinsman redeemer, is basically what she's telling her right now. And up until this point, uh, Naomi most likely wore uh, what they have, kind of a different type of clothing, widow's clothing, because as you know, her husband uh, died in Moab. So they might have had this kind of uh, other type of robe, widow's robe, uh, if you will. So there's different types of black clothing that could have had at that point. And thus, Naomi wants Ruth to upgrade her appearance uh, appropriately to appeal to Boaz. Also, if Boaz is willing to take her as his bride to be his kinsman, uh, to be the kinsman redeemer, uh, most likely she would become immediately his wife at that time. We also saw in the last study that there's two laws of Moses that uh, is being implemented in the story regarding uh, Naomi and Ruth. First of all, uh, Naomi's inheritance of the land had to have been sold uh, at some point to get the debt, or and thus Naomi had to either find a way to buy back her field uh, or her inheritance of the land or wait for the next um, year of Jubilee. Uh, to get her land back, which could take up to 50 years. So that was kind of uh, one of the processes at that time. Naomi desired to find a way to get the money to buy back the uh, family's land. So she uh, thought that perhaps the kinsman redeemer would buy back the land for her. The second thing that we also notice is that the another law described in Leviticus uh, 25, uh, which states a man who has been married, and if he's died without having uh, a son, as to carry out his name. So his brother was required uh, by the law to take the widow as his wife and raise up children to his brother. So that was kind of another particular law that was being taken place here. And again, they didn't have children at that time. So Boaz, as we mentioned last time, uh, most likely could have been the brother of Naomi's husband, Emelech, uh, and thus he would be able to raise up uh, children of uh, Michelon, Ruth's deceased husband, although they didn't have children, as we mentioned, by taking Ruth as his wife. Boaz could buy Naomi's land, raise up a family uh, on that very land. So that was kind of the idea behind this. And you may wonder, why is it in our story that Ruth comes to Boaz and ask him to be her kinsman redeemer. Why didn't Boaz ask her? Right. So the, the reason is that in Israel, the widow with no son was herself to go to the deceased husband's brother to see. So that was the reason why. So it wasn't the other way around. And so this is the, the law of um, what was being worked out in Leviticus 25. So as we mentioned, Boaz symbolizes Jesus Christ in our, as our kinsman redeemer. Um, so Jesus, uh, one of our own, is willing to and able to save to the uttermost. Uh, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you have to call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved. He doesn't force himself on us. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we have to make that choice. We have to make that decision. And, and you notice here the meticulous instructions that Naomi gives Ruth to, uh, to, for her to prepare for the coming of Boaz and requesting that he acts toward her uh, as a kinsman redeemer. So we see then uh, that which is kind of needing preparation in ourselves when we come to this. There are three things given for Ruth to do. To wash yourself, anoint yourself, and to put on your best clothes. So each of these are very uh, common um, in the Old Testament. Uh, you'll see different examples of this throughout the Old Testament. Uh, each is uh, also interpreted for us in the New Testament. We also notice that these symbolizes what any Christian should do to draw close to the Lord. Uh, and draw near to him. And as, as we prepare for the, the return of Christ. We, we want to be prepared uh, every single day. So the first thing you notice there is to wash yourself. Most likely uh, because she had been working in the field all day. So she probably needed a, 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 a fresh uh, you know, bath you know, and shower or whatnot. Uh, but this is more of a special event. It was a special preparation required. So this isn't just your typical bath. Uh, she, she was to wash. 
And in those days, again, washing wasn't necessarily a daily occurrence. It is like in ours. Okay, so it's kind of a, um, they did it every once in a while, not a, a regular occurrence. So this, as we said, was a special event, special preparation was required. For us spiritually, uh, we are to be washed by the water of the word, as Ephesians 5 tells us. Uh, and, and so it's meaning to examine ourselves by the word. Uh, allowing it to govern our attitudes and our motives and our desires. Everything should be filtered out of the Word of God. And in times of testing, the, the Word of God is a light into our path that gives us hope to persevere. As believers, each of us are to pursue that sanctification. We talked about that earlier this morning, and that walking in holiness. It's something that we're all called to do and walking in obedience. God gives you everything that you need to pertain to life and godliness, but we've got to take those steps forward as well. So we're to continue to seek the Lord's cleansing in our lives of any sin, of any impurity, uh, so it's removed from us. Uh, and we do this as often uh, as we're aware of sin or attitudes or behaviors in our lives. And the Lord tells us in his word, you know, that, there's a, that there needs to be this regular house cleansing uh, to be done in our lives. And so sin must be confessed, repented uh, by us as believers. So this is something that we to examine ourselves on a regular basis. And as 1 John uh, 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse of our sins from all unrighteousness. So as believers, we are to live our lives as if the Lord could return at any moment. Uh, for the Lord's return is at any time. You know, we're living in these last days. And I guarantee you, if you knew the Lord was going to come back tonight, you know, you know you'd know, you probably want to make sure you're right with the Lord, right? This is how we should always be living our lives, though. So after she washed, she was to anoint herself. Notice that. So in those days, they had different perfume and oils uh, for different purposes. As believers, again, we have the anointing of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so whenever we talk about the anointing, it always speaks of the enabling and empowering of the Holy Spirit, as Ephesians 5.18 tells us, uh, to be filled or to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is uh, critical in times of refining when our natural reactions to be anything but controlled. You know, we always respond in the flesh. We always have attitudes when we're going through difficult things. And so this reference to the perfume here uh, by Naomi, uh, this perfume uh, throughout the centuries have been used uh, by women to make their scent more appealing to men. So there's different fragrances that some women like. You know, and men have different uh, colognes that they like, you know, uh, and you can smell some of these people down the, the hall because they put so much on, you know, and you can get a headache by wearing some of this stuff. <laughs> Anyways, but symbolically, the anointing here is referring to the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the lives of his people. So as Christians, we are cleansed from our sin. We should ask the Lord to also anoint us and empower us uh, with the Holy Spirit. And the two should always be automatically connected uh, in our minds as believers, cleansing and anointing. We need them both. You know, we need to continue to walk in the Spirit. We need to be walking in love, walking in grace. And, and the Spirit's work in the life of a Christian uh, is manifold in producing us the fruit of the Spirit uh, and the character of Christ. When you look at Galatians 5, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how we should be responding. That's the character of Christ. Um, and then there's also the empowerment for service uh, through the use of those gifts and also the enlightenment of our minds to the truth. We're also reminded in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, tells how the Holy Spirit anointing uh, that we have allows us to understand the truth that the Lord has given us in His Word, where it says, As for you, the anointing which you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need anyone to teach you, but His anointing teaches you about all things. It is true and not a lie, and just as He it taught you, you abide in Him. So we have the truth, we have the Spirit working in us. He leads us, guides us, directs us um, into a closer relationship with Him. So after the, the washing and the anointing or perfume, uh, she was to pot, put on her best clothes. Notice that. Put on your best clothes. So this kind of speaks of a righteous life for us as believers. Uh, and, and this is only possible to the extent that we've got uh, the first two tasks already taken place. So we need to wash first. We need to anoint and put that perfume on, right? And then we can put on the best clothes. 
So Ruth at this point had in time most likely, as we said, worn kind of those widow's clothes. Um, and um, these would not be appropriate for a woman uh, who is now planning on moving on with her life and, and to be a, a bride-to-be. You know, you're not going to want to be wearing that old clothes. You want your best to you look uh, for that ceremony, if you will. So Ruth dressed herself to be wed, which is the idea behind this thought here. So at no, Naomi's prompting, Ruth puts her most presentable dress on, and uh, and, and we're going to see it's not, not only that does she wear the dress, but she also puts on a veil, um, as we'll see in a moment. So we also know this later that uh, uh, in the chapter that Boaz asked Ruth to take off her veil or the shawl, as we see in our text here, which is the same word, uh, so he can load it up with a bunch of grain. So in our story here, if Boaz takes Ruth up on her offer to become her kinsman redeemer, and takes her as his wife, she now immediately becomes his bride. So there's symbolism here for us as believers uh, in Ruth's clothing on this particular night. So as believers, we are seeking uh, to be the person that God wants us to be, and to have a heart prepared to meet him uh, should he return for us tonight or any time. And so not only are we to be putting off the sin that comes into our life, but there are things in Scripture that we are to put on, uh, like the putting on clothing. In Romans thirteen fourteen says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Also in uh, Romans uh, 13, uh, 12 says, The night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. We're told in Ephesians to put on the armor of God, right? Now turn over to Colossians chapter 3 for a moment. And this is one of those other great passages. In fact, when I first got saved, um, and I went to the, the high school pastor of my church, um, they had me read this passage, this chapter. Uh, so this is the first thing I ever remember when I first got saved. And it, it always meant so much to me since then. The importance of walking with the Lord, putting on and putting off. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll pick it up in verse 8 through 14. And this is a very practical, very impacting passage for every believer. This is something that you should always have down. So it says in verse 8, But now you yourselves to put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. That means cussing. Um, Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and you put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. For there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God... Holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, which you are called into one body, and be thankful. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? Imagine if every believer actually did this. It would rock the world uh, and the church, you know. But this is what we're all called to do, to be putting off. And the thing that I learned is it's not so much focusing on the putting off. If you focus on putting on, the putting off takes care of itself. So that's what we need to be focusing on. Anyways, back to Ruth. So Ruth was to, told to lay at Boaz's feet and allow him to tell you what you should do. So on this particular night of threshing, Ruth was to come to Boaz, if you will, by faith. So she had to take the step of faith. She was willing to take this risk and uh, trust him with every aspect of her life. And so she must trust him that he will indeed be her kinsman redeemer uh, and take her to be his bride. And for his part, again, Boaz must go and do whatever is necessary in order to procure Ruth as his bride. So there's another step that has to be taken place as well. So Ruth's response to Boaz was to lay at her feet in humble submission, wait upon him in order to see what it is that he tells her to do. For us as Christians, again, we're sitting at the feet, laying at the feet of Jesus, whom Boaz symbolizes as our kinsman redeemer. And he gives us three types of rest. One of those rests is you're resting in his power. 
So Boaz, again, must do whatever it takes to redeem Ruth. And this includes dealing with other authorities and principalities. So likewise, Jesus is the one who has done everything that is necessary to secure our salvation. So going to the cross of Calvary and making atonement for our sins, Jesus did for us what we could not do uh, for ourselves or never been able to do for ourselves. And so Jesus had disarmed all the rulers and powers and authorities in the spiritual realm, securing our salvation upon the cross. You know, all our sins, past, present, future, have been nailed to the cross. He's disarmed uh, those principalities. And so living by faith as a believer, we are to rest in the sufficiency of Christ and know that he can and he will meet all the needs that we have in our lives. And so we must not be self-sufficient, but instead draw upon the sufficiency of Christ. The second rest, that is that of the faith. So as Christians, we come to salvation when we place our faith and trust in uh, Jesus Christ and in him alone. We cannot be saved as long as we try to keep looking back, uh, having a backup plan, or somehow trust ourselves, or any other means for salvation besides the Lord himself and his work upon the cross. So again, it's, it's, you know, there, there's just faith alone and grace alone, uh, not by works or any other things or deeds that we do. So as believers, we may talk about living by faith, but in reality, how are we truly living by faith? What are we relying on, placing our faith in? Uh, is it the Lord uh, and his resources alone, or is it something else? So again, this is where you, you completely uh, trust in his sufficiency and what he has done for us. The third thing we're to have rest in is submission. So we come to salvation through Christ. We come to grow in our faith and our walk with the Lord as we submit ourselves completely to the Lord. You surrender to him, that he is truly your Lord. So again, those people receive him as Savior, but as he their Lord of their life. And so we got to do whatever he, he wants us to do. He tells us to do. We submit to him. Uh, we follow his commands. Uh, and such rest and submission. So, so we can rest in knowing, again, that the Lord is completely in control. He is sovereign. Um, and, and that he will tell us whatever he wants us to do. He knows uh, what is best for us. Uh, we don't have to, um, you know, have everything figured out uh, or, or know how God is going to work in our lives. We just need to trust him. Just take it one step at a time. He'll take you to the next step. Just follow him today. Keep the course. Uh, verse 6 continues. So she went down to the threshing floor and did all that her mother-in-law had instructed her. After Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, tickled it a little bit, just kidding, uh, laid down. <laughs> and it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned to himself, and there was a woman lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. So here we see Ruth is carrying out uh, preparation for redemption. As we see here, after uh, Boaz lays down, falls asleep on the threshing floor, she comes down and lays at his feet. And this is the specific instructions that Naomi gave Ruth as to what she was to do uh, this particular night and, uh, and for Boaz to fulfill her, his role and, and, for her, uh, and to take her as his bride. So here we see the instructions by Naomi, and Naomi uh, expected Ruth to carry out these uh, plans to the letter. You know, so this is the whole idea. She's going to follow them exactly how it's, it was commanded her to do. So at the time of harvest, it was a time of rejoicing because it signaled the fruit of one's labor could be enjoyed. So this is why they're celebrating. They're excited about this time. And so Ruth waited for Boaz to have a good evening, to have a nice meal and merry heart, to have some drink. And then after he lays down, he's gone to sleep. Ruth sneaks in, lies by his feet and takes the blanket off his feet and covers herself with it. She's hugged. You know, hogging the covers, if you will. <clears throat> so in the middle of the night, Boaz started to get cold. And she elbowed. Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> so because probably the blanket had been removed by the feet. 
by uh, Ruth. And so uh, when he goes to pull the, the blanket, he's startled and sees that there's this woman lying at his feet. And so when Ruth tells Boaz uh, who she is, she then proposes to Boaz to fulfill his role as kinsman redeemer, to marry her uh, as she asks to spread uh, his covering over her since she's a kinsman redeemer. That's such a romantic way of being proposed for, huh? So Ruth refers to herself kind of in an interesting way here. Notice it says she calls herself your maid servant. She didn't call herself the Moabite, which she could have, but she no longer identifies that way, um, because she's making a proposal to Boaz. She's avowing herself to be an Israelite forevermore. So we also see she's surrendering herself to him to be his wife by using this particular phrase as well. In verse 9, this phrase also reveals that Ruth is asking Boaz to place her under the, the authority, the covering of his wings as that kinsman redeemer. And thus we have demonstrated here that Ruth is asking Boaz to, to take her as his bride. Uh, purchasing back from the current owner of the land of, um, you know, originally belonged to Naomi and Elimelech. So as uh, Ruth claimed Boaz as her kinsman redeemer, so what must we by faith claim uh, the promises of God, you know, and putting our faith and trust in him. And here's the thing with faith always grows when we act on God's promises. You know, when you start to take that step of faith and you're, you know, growing in your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So this is how you're going to grow uh, the most in your walk. Verse 10 goes on to say, Then he says, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end of the beginning, and you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor, or poor or rich. Either way, I twist things up in my reading anyway. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you as you request. And all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a closer relative than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative to you, good, let him do it. But if he doesn't perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives, lie down until morning. So as we see here with Ruth and, and Boaz, Boaz is given a blessing to Ruth, vows to redeem her in the morning if this other uh, condition isn't met. So Booth's reaction, uh, Boaz's uh, reaction to Ruth's proposal reveals that he perhaps was already in love with her. He wanted her and wanted to spend time with her and hoping that uh, with all his heart throughout the harvest that Ruth would seek uh, him out to redeem her. And so Boaz evidently thought that since he was an older man perhaps, that Ruth was a younger woman, that she would be more interested in marrying a... I'm going to sneeze... <laughs> <coughs> Bless me. Someone that was much younger than him. So that was probably a thought there. And so maybe there was another brother that was younger, closer to her age. That was probably the idea. So Boaz truly had in his heart set it upon Ruth, requesting him to be her kinsman redeemer. So Boaz's response to accept the uh, marriage proposal if the uh, legal course uh, necessary was completed. So Boaz tells Ruth that he'll do whatever it takes if she asks of him. And, and the reason because he had heard that the whole city was aware of Ruth was a woman of excellence, a virtuous woman. The term virtuous woman is used in uh, Proverbs 31, as we all know. We married the, the, the Proverbs 31 woman. And uh, so, so there's qualities and character that we see with this woman. And, and this is another key principle to keep in mind. It's, it's also about having maturity and character. Uh, it's as important to have that stability in marriage. And so it provides stability in a relationship when you have that virtuous woman or mature characters. And uh, no wonder a virtuous wife is far above rubies. You know, you can have, you know, good discussions, you know, whether even disagreements and not people running on their emotions or blame, uh, you know, everything for their problems. So verse 12 goes on to say and talks about how uh, Boaz tells Ruth that there is a man who's actually closer relative to Emelech than himself. And this man uh, has a greater right to redeem her. 
So as, as we said, you know, there could be this other brother, could be another relative that's closer uh, in that sense. Um, and so it could have been that, uh, you know, closer to the, the age uh, of Emelech and uh, even the conjecture that uh, Boaz had actually been a cousin to Amalek. So that's the other thought here. So he might not have been a brother, could have been more of a cousin. Uh, either way, uh, we see the uh, idea and the thought here. So Boaz tells Ruth just to continue to lie down his feet until morning and leave everything in his hands until it's all taken care of. And then you notice there in verse 13, as the Lord lives. So what he's essentially saying is that if the Lord wills it to be, you know, he's going to perform this duty to her. So, um, you know, and this speaks not only of his character, but also wanting to do everything by the book. You know, uh, he's speaking of his patience and not striving here. And that's that speaks volumes. You know, that's mature character there. And by that, I mean that Boaz doesn't want to strive for this if it's not God's will. Don't push your own agenda. Uh, you know, so, so the Lord's giving, he's giving the Lord plenty of space, plenty of opportunity, plenty of elbow room, if you will. Lord, if you don't want it to happen, you know, make this other thing happen, you know, but either way, your will be done. Verse 14 goes on to say, so she laid out his feet until morning. She arose before one could recognize another. And then he says, do not let it be known that the woman came to the th threshing floor. He also said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when he, uh, she held it, uh, it measured six ephahs of barley on her, and then she went into the city. So we notice that she slept there until the, the sun was about to rise, and then he gave her a bunch more barley grain to take back home to Naomi. So according to uh, the lexicon, the word shawl there actually means veil. Uh, so uh, it shows that kind of Ruth was actually dressed up like a bride to be on that night. That's the image that you get through this. So Boaz is excited at the prospect of taking Ruth uh, as his bride, and he uh, overflowing towards with her in generosity. And uh, so this uh, six barley. So that's probably like you know you know weeks and months worth of food, if you will. So you just see just the generosity here, um, and so. And that's the way the Lord is. He is so gracious in his generosity in our lives. It's amazing, you know, just how he takes care of us. You know, uh, the Apostle John wrote in the uh, Gospel of uh, John, chapter 1, verse 16, describes how uh, Christ is in his generosity fulfilled each of our lives. That uh, it's the fullness of that we've all received grace upon grace. Uh, likewise, in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 7 and 8, uh, we read how the Lord lavishes his grace. And that word, uh, uh, root word is also gifts upon us. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. You know, it's just that lavishing, that generosity. Verse 16 continues, then she came to her mother-in-law and she says, is that you, my daughter? And then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she says, These six ifaths of barley he gave me, and he said to me, Do not go empty handed to your mother in law. And then he said then she says, Sit still, my daughter, until you know the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. So the situation turns out much better than Naomi or Ruth had ever anticipated. So Boaz not only understood Ruth's meaning, uh, but also blessed her for her readiness uh, to marry him and uh, as the kinsman redeemer, although he uh, was clearly considerably older than she was. So that was a big risk factor there. What if he says no? You know, just you'd probably feel rejected and all that. So there's all kinds of scenarios we can play out on our head. He didn't take offense to Ruth's open and honest statement of her need because he knew her heart and he knew her motivation. And then when he commended her for her kindness, the, the word that is often used there, it's designated kind of this covenant love and faithfulness to the Lord and his people, uh, which we've already been shown by the, to be a quality that of Boaz, um, you know, possessed that in full measure. So he sees that same quality in Ruth as well, uh, which is clearly growing in the likeness of the Lord. Uh, she's become, uh, you know, uh, to trust and to worship the Lord. 
His reference to her kindness at the beginning may have also been the fact that she was also prepared, you know, from the uh, to return to Bethlehem with Naomi um, at all, as we saw back in chapter two, verse eleven, um, or, or possibly is her acceptance uh, of the request not to reap anyone else's field throughout the the harvest period, as we also saw in verse eight. So we can see there's a combination there. So Ruth comes and tells Naomi uh, how the evening and her proposal with Boaz went. So when Naomi hears from Ruth about that night and that proposal, she was excited. She knows that Boaz will redeem Ruth uh, since he has the greatest resources and commands. And uh, he is both willing and able to keep every word that he had promised to Ruth. So he's a man of his word. So Naomi knows that Boaz is not going to give himself any rest until he's kept every one of those promises. In a better way, Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, is faithful and true in our lives as well. The promises that we have, you know, how he's fulfilled all these promises. So he, uh, he always keeps his promise uh, and he makes his children and he will not give himself rest until he's fulfilled every one of them in us as well. So for us, as the bride of Christ, we need to follow Ruth's example uh, to be prepared in our hearts to meet the Lord should he come for us or, you know, we if we happen to die, you know, and we're going to be with him to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So we need to follow her preparation uh, to prepare uh, to be the bride of as uh, Ruth was to Boaz, uh, we are to be that bride of Christ when he returns for us. So we need to wash ourselves from all sin and defilement, anoint ourselves by asking for the filling and uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to put on our best clothes, let the Lord conform you into his image. And it's that whole work of sanctification in our lives and walking in holiness. Uh, lie at Jesus' feet in humble submission and to rest in him and his sufficiency. Keep trusting in him never underestimate the inward humility and character over the outward beauty and never underestimate the value of stepping out in faith and and taking a risk and trusting the lord as you're sensing the lord moving in your life or conversations or how to minister to people pray with people or witness to people just trust what he's going to do he's going to give you the words to say he's going to give you uh, whatever you need in that moment so we can keep trusting him to provide amen Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us this wonderful story in the book of Ruth. As we see the preparation that she had to meet Boaz, may we have the same preparation, how we wash ourselves, how we anoint ourselves, and how we put on the best clothes for you. We are clothed in your righteousness, Lord. And that we would be uh, clothed with the uh, armor of God as we fight the the, the spiritual battles uh, in this day and age. The trials, the temptations, uh, we uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this story, Lord. And pray that you continue to minister to each one of our hearts in the only way that you can. And you know our deepest needs, our issues, our, our future. And may we continue to look to you as the author and finisher of our faith. We worship you and we adore you. We, we surrender to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.